if they're not able to join tonight. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. This idea came about when Karen and I were on a little backpack excursion up in Baxter State Park and I was telling her a little bit about this program and she said, geez, I think maybe that would be a good one for our Maine Master Naturalist folks to hear about. So what I'm going to talk about is our Forestry for Maine Birds program at Maine Audubon. We started this in about 2013 and it's just been growing exponentially since then. And it's really about um, how to work with landowners, foresters, and, and loggers on how to manage your woodlands in a way that benefits not just uh, trees, but birds and other wildlife. So, um, not getting it to go forward. Let's see. Oops. Slide. Oh, there we go. Um, well, so why birds? You know, we picked birds. I'm sure some of you are birders in the group and others of you may be more interested in other kinds of natural history items, but bird, we know from surveys that have been done of woodland owners across the country that birds matter to landowners. And they are easy, you know, they're bright, they're colorful, they're cheerful with their songs, they are relatively easy to see and find compared with lots of other wildlife that might be slinking around through the woodlands. And in addition to that, you know, they can be surrogates for other wildlife, the fish and wildlife that use the forest. So in addition to, you know, if you manage your woodland to benefit different kinds of birds, then you also benefit all kinds of other wildlife, fish, water quality, and provide opportunities for people to recreate, including hunting and fishing, if you are interested in that sort of thing. Um, and another reason why we've focused in on birds is because we know based in particular based on some recent studies that have been done that uh, birds are really struggling. So there was a an excellent overview on this topic done uh, in 2019 by the National Association of Bird Conservation Initiative in Canada, where they put out this state of the Canada's birds report. And then National Audubon also that same year released a study called 389 Bird Species on the Brink, which looked specifically at how climate change might be affecting birds. And um, so in the state of Canada's birds report, this is a, a great graph that sort of illustrates what they discovered after looking at data over a long period of time since 1970 based on about 13 or 14 different data sets, including the breeding bird survey that are done nationally every year. And so you can see that, that many species have seen a dramatic decline, are seeing a dramatic decline since the 1970s. The only ones that are really doing better are our waterfowl and our raptors. And really that's because in the case of the waterfowl, there's been so much emphasis placed on trying to find and protect their breeding habitat. Ducks Unlimited has been really involved in that effort. And then for the raptors, that increase is largely due to the ban on DDT. But everything else is either somewhat stable or slightly declining or substantially declining. And forest birds are one of those groups that is slowly declining. Um, another study, <clears throat> similar study was done, at, released in the Journal of Science last year that also looked at the changes in bird populations and they were able to document that those declines that you just saw in that previous slide amount to a loss of almost 3 billion birds since 1970. And so what does that, that look like? You know, we, we've, we've seen just steady decline across many different species groups, some 
more so than others. And this gives you a nice little illustration that comes from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Our most dramatic declines have been seen in our grassland birds and in shorebirds, but we also are seeing significant declines in our boreal forest birds, a number of which nest and breed in northern Maine, in addition to much of Canada, and then in our eastern forest birds. So anywhere from 17% less or fewer to 53% fewer birds since the 1970s. That's, that's a big decline. You know, I've talked to some old timers here who started birding um, when they were young and they tell me over and over again how there just aren't as many birds out there as there used to be. Not as many species, not as many individuals of those species. Here's uh, one example of the Canada warbler. This is sort of a poster child of a species that has seen this dramatic decline. And you can see on the graphic in the upper right, the areas that are sort of that brownish color, tannish color are areas where they're decreasing. So they're, they're decreasing across much of their range, not the entire range, but across most of the range. And that's really concerning. So National Audubon also did this big study where they looked at all this data, habitat data, and what kinds of different habitats, different species key into. And if uh, the climate is going to warm under different scenarios, what does that look like for our different birds? And what they've found for the Atlantic flyway is that under a warming scenario of two degrees Celsius. We've got about 18 species that are highly vulnerable, 88 that are moderately vulnerable, and 60 that are low vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> and so what does that look like? Well, here's one example for the wood thrush. We know that wood thrush, <clears throat> excuse me, are already struggling. Their populations have declined quite a bit. But the um, map on the left here shows what the current range is and the map in the middle is what it might look like with a 1.5 degree increase by 20 the year 2080 which sounds like a really long time away but it's not as long as we think and so you can see the red areas are where their population is going to be declining the blue areas are places where they're going to be expanding and by <clears throat> under a even higher warming scenario, you'll see that much of the east is lost basically as a viable range for wood thrush. Maine is doing okay, you know, there's still be here, but there may be fewer of them. And then they'll be expanding up into the Maritimes and southern Quebec. So let's take a little bit closer look at what those studies have shown for our forest birds. As you saw earlier, 17% decline, and, but that decline is across 64% of all species. So it's not limited just to a few. The majority of our species are showing significant decline. And if you want to think about how many birds we're talking about, we're talking about 167 million birds. Under the boreal bird, forest birds, it gets even worse. 33% decline overall, over 50%, 50% of all species showing decline and a loss of 501 million birds. So another way to think about this is that nearly one in four of all of our Eastern forest birds and one in three of all of our boreal forest birds that used to be here in 1970 are no longer with us. So they're not, we're not seeing them in our woods anymore. So we came up, well, Vermont started a program a number of years ago called Foresters for the Birds, and we learned about this project and decided, hey, we should bring this to Maine. And so, um, you know, why Maine? Why Vermont? What you're seeing on this slide is a map of the breeding bird survey routes that are run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. These are the routes that have been run since 1970. And the dark red colors show that we see more forest birds on our routes than 
almost anywhere else in the country other than the upper Midwest of northern Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. So, you know, th this is where forest birds live. And another uh, example of that is here's a map showing that National Audubon put together that shows where are the last remaining blocks of forest habitat. And you'll see what jumps right out at you, right? That, that big block of forest in Maine. It's the last best place that we have for these forest birds. And these birds travel from far away to come back to Maine every year to breed. It's a long perilous journey. They have to fly both ways any, every, any given year. Why do they do that? Because we have over 17 million acres of forest land here. It's full of diverse types of forest and different age forests. There's lots of trees and places for them to nest. We also have abundant insects and I'm not talking about black flies and mosquitoes, although we have plenty of those. What I'm really talking about are caterpillars. They, they, or the, the adults will feed their young caterpillars and they're kind of like protein pills. And we have really long days, which means that they have a lot of hours during the day in which to collect those caterpillars, bring them back to their young, feed their young, to the tune of sometimes they can actually produce two or three clutches in one season. Um, so this area is so important to our eastern forest birds. We have over 90 different species of birds that nest in our forests. And it, it has been designated as a globally important bird area by National Audubon. You can see there really aren't that many places that, are, that reach that level of significance. And it's the largest area in all of the United States that is designated as a globally significant bird, important bird area. These are areas where there are either concentrations of a lot of individuals of one or two species, or places where there are lots of different species with lots of different individuals of those species, which is the case here in our forests. Um, so Forestry for Maine birds is really designed, as I mentioned earlier, to work with forest landowners and managers to help create great breeding habitat for these birds. Mm -hmm. And it's a collaboration between Maine Audubon, the Maine Forest Service, the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, and the Forest mm -hmm. Stewards Guild. And this is kind of a little picture um, of what the forest means to our birds. As you can see here, different species use different types of forest and different parts of the forest. Some like to be in the tops of the trees, some like to be down near the ground, some like to be near water, some need dead snags. Um, and so you can pack, if you have lots of different types of forest and lots of different features within that forest, then you can pack a lot of different species and a lot of different individuals of each species into the forest. And you can see a schematic over there on the right with um, different migratory pathways for different species. We have our short distance migrants, yellow that points out for something like a woodcock, our medium distance for something like a um, scarlet tanager, and then these really long, long migratory pathways for black pole warblers. And one of the most amazing things about black pole warblers is that while you can see two different pathways going north, they, they breed in northern Maine and then they breed mostly up in Canada and up into Alaska. But in the fall, they all come back to Maine and then jump off the coast on their way down to South America. It's a, an 1800 mile flight and sometimes <laughs> takes them something like 48 hours to nonstop to get there. So these are tough birds, but they need our help. So what we did is we identified 20 different species that are representative of 
a whole suite of other species that use different types of habitats and different features within the forest. And um, this is our little collection here of the 20 different species. And what we've done is we've created a series of guidebooks that talks about the habitat needs of each of these different species and then how you can sort of help create the habitat that they need. So we put together a guide for woodland owners, for loggers, for foresters, and then we have these fun little bird and habitat trading cards that you can put on a key ring and carry, carry into the woods with you for quick reference. And this is what a page from the Forester's Guide looks like. The Forester's Guide is the most technical guide. The other ones have, are sort of derived from that first one. But for each species, we've got a picture, identification, the forest conditions they like, and then this nice little schematic that shows the type of habitat that they prefer. On the side of each page, it'll tell you which, type, which of the four major forest types they like. This is oak pine, northern hardwood, northern mixed wood, or northern softwood, and then whether they like young, intermediate, or old um, forests, ages the best. And so I'm going to show you just some of the species that we have identified as our priority bird species. Most of these species have risen to the level of being a priority species because Either their populations are showing significant decline, a large percentage of their global population breeds here in the Northeast, or they are um, uniquely found in Northern Maine, particularly for our boreal bird species, and you just don't see them very many other places in the US. So for our Northern softwood species, we've got things like the bay-breasted warbler, which keys in, I'm gonna just tell you a little, little fun fact about each of these species. I'm not going to go into great detail, but bay-breasted warblers are one of those species that cues into the uh, spruce budworm. And when you see an elevation in the number of spruce budworm, like we're seeing up in Quebec Lakes right now, then these birds, along with Cape May warblers and Blackpool warblers and Tennessee warblers, uh, their population just explodes. And last summer, I happened to be up in the Gaspé Peninsula in Quebec, and they were everywhere because they are having an outbreak of spruce budworms. So these birds actually respond to that outbreak and then they help keep that outbreak in control. Our um, black-throated green warblers, you typically find in some sort of hemlock stand or other softwood stand midway in the canopy. Uh, Blackback woodpeckers are really tied to these these uh, older trees with flaky bark on them because they go after the insects underneath that flaky bark. Perula warblers, you often see at the tops of tall softwood trees, but they really, you'll only find them where they have the Spanish moss or old man's beard moss hanging down because that's what they use to make their nests with. Boreal chickadees are very much tied in with our, our softwood stands, typically kind of a middle-aged sort of and then in some of the gap openings, you might find uh, olive-sided flycatchers. And then when we switch to northern mixed wood, so this would be part softwood, part hardwood species, Blackburnian warblers love to be way up at the very tops of those trees, high, singing high, high up on the tops of the trees. When that sunlight hits that orange breast, man, it just wants to knock you over. And then coming down from the tops of the forest to the middle of the forest or lower, the magnolia warblers really like dense stands of softwoods. They, they, um, I've seen them most often, honestly, in bogs where you have these stunted growth of hemlock and, or not hemlock, but um, spruce and fir. And they like to hide right in those, but you also find them in regenerating stands, or young stands of softwoods, excuse me, that are coming to the back up after harvest. And then something like um, black-throated blue warbler likes to be down near the lower part of the forest in what's called in hobble bush in particular. They like to nest and hang out in the hobble bush. And Canada warblers are found in really dense shrubby areas right near water, very low, they nest right on the ground. 
And then our yellow bellied sapsuckers, of course, are very tied in with st uh, dead or decaying trees where they drill these little holes. The sap runs out in those holes and they will go after either the sap or the insects that are attracted to the sap. And then we are moving to our northern hardwood species. And we have, again, the yellow-bellied sapsucker but, and, and the eastern wood peewee. This is another species that is found in small gap openings in the forest. Veeries, which are one of our many thrushes, along with our hermit thrush and our wood thrush uh, and robins. And veeries are often found in the sort of mid-story area, the middle part of the forest but they like to hang out on the ground where they are kicking aside leaves, picking up insects from the moist soil, and they are often found near water. And then chestnut-sided warblers are one of those species that really likes um, young forest that is growing back up after a bunch of other trees have fallen over and opened up a gap within the forest. And then finally, down here in uh, southern Maine, where we have oak pine forest, the dominant type of forest, we see our wood thrush and hermit thrush, but this wood thrush, scarlet tanagers love to be, uh, they love really big old oak trees. They really often are singing from the very tops of those oak trees. Flickers are sort of our common woodpecker in the oak pine forest. And although you often see them in open areas on lawns or, or cemeteries or something like that, they need forests to nest in because that's what they are cavity nesters. So they need those decaying standing trees. And then oven birds are really only found where you have a good thick leaf litter layer because they use that to create a nest that looks just like an oven with a side opening on the forest floor. So as you can see, we have different species that are using different types of forest and different places within the forest. So what we try to do with our Forestry for Maine Birds program is go out into a stand uh, or on somebody's property and do what we call a quick habitat assessment. All you need for that are six fingers, uh, six or 10. You can use somewhere between. And so this was a, a workshop that we did where we have a number of different folks that are learning how to do this quick habitat assessment. Well, what are they looking for? And what are we looking for with that assessment? We wanna look for canopy trees where you might find a scarlet tanager. Do we have any big tall canopy trees? We're looking for some canopy gaps where you might find that Eastern wood peewee. We're looking for a dense mid-story where something like the wood thrush would be flying around and calling. We're looking for snags and cavity trees for our yellow-bellied sapsuckers. We're looking for a dense understory. Where's the hobble bush? There really isn't any in this picture here, right? For the black-throated blue warbler. And then what's on the ground? Do, you, do we have some leaves, leaf litter on the ground for oven birds? Do we have some dead wood that can be used by ruffed grouse and other species that are dependent on that down woody material. So let's take another quick look at, the, at this. For the habitat assessment, as I said, we've got 10 fingers that we can use. Each finger sort of represents a different feature within the forest that we're looking for. And it's a great way to kind of remember what's important from the bird's perspective and what are you seeing as you're looking around? So we're looking for in the, the gap openings. Is there an overstory, midstory, an understory layer? Is there water nearby? Is there any leaf litter? You're not going to get leaf litter in a softwood stand, but in a hardwood stand or in a mixed hardwood softwood stand, that's important. Is there fine woody material like these Treetops here are coarse woody material, which would be these big logs down on the ground. Are there dead stags or decaying trees where our woodpeckers can nest? And then do we have any big, really big old trees? <clears throat> so it's, it, um, 
And we, we have a, a more technical form that you can fill out and we provide that to foresters and others who really want to a more quantitative approach towards identifying the habitat values that are present and values that you might want to create over time. But the quick habitat assessment is what we use for most landowners <clears throat> and interested folks like yourselves. So again, the first thing we're looking for is the forest type, age, and tree size. Oak pine, northern softwood, northern hardwood, mixed wood. Now, and then next we're looking for different vegetation layers. And we have three different layers that we focus in on. The overstory, which is over 30 feet high. The midstory, which is six to 30 feet high. And then the understory, which is zero to six feet high. And as you can see by this schematic, different species, again, cue into each of those different layers. And some need a lot of vegetation in all three layers, or you just won't find them there, even though they might spend most of their time in either the overstory or the midstory, for example. And then we know that dead standing wood, like snags, are really important. And essentially, the bigger the better, and the more the better. So pileated woodpeckers, for example, need a snag that's at least um, 12 or 14 inch diameter at breast height. And if you don't have big old snags like that, you're not gonna have pileated woodpeckers. Some of our smaller species that are cavity nesters like chickadees don't need quite as big a snag. And then down woody material is really important for a variety of reasons. Rough grouse will drum on those hollow logs. That's how they, they flap their wings and they create this sound that reverberates through the logs when they're trying to attract their mate. But things like fisher and martin and squirrels all use down woody material to move through the forest as well. And they are hunting often in these areas because they might find small mammals or amphibians and reptiles underneath those logs. And then I don't have a picture, but the, the collection of fine woody material, sort of treetops, branches that are piled, are also really valuable for our, many of our forest birds because they'll hide in there from predators or they will be searching in those areas. And then, as I mentioned, the leaf litter can be really important for some species like this oven bird. Isn't that just an amazing little picture there coming on the side that's right down on the ground. And in some cases, in some places, uh, mostly outside of Maine, we're starting to see now places where the leaf litter has been completely eaten away by non-native earthworms. Well, all of our earthworms are non-native, but They've gotten so abundant, they've become so abundant that they've stripped the ground cover away. So one of the things that we also encourage people to look for are signs of invasives, whether it be on the ground or up in the trees. We have um, be beetles, emerald ash borer beetles. We have um, hemlock woolly adelgid that's coming into our forest that are potential threats to the livelihood of our, some of our tree species. This is our little spruce budworm caterpillar that I mentioned earlier that Cape May warblers cue in on. And they, are, they are native, but they, are, they have this boom and bust cycle. So they, about every 40 years or so, they will explode. So the bottom line that we're trying to encourage folks to try to do to help our birds here in Maine, is to promote diverse mature forest stands. And these are stands that have lots of vegetation in the overstory, the midstory, and the understory. They have small gaps that mimic natural disturbance, because the natural disturbance in Maine was largely from big old trees that would die and fall over with a, or a windstorm that would come through and knock out a small patch of trees. And so what we suggest is if you're gonna create these small gaps, keep them under two acres, anywhere from a 10th of an acre to two acres. We're not talking about clear cuts here. There are some species that, that will use and actually prefer really young forests, but 
there's a lot more young forest in Maine than old forest. So we're trying to promote this, these mature forest stands. We know we need dead standing trees and dead down trees in the forest to have a full complement of species. And you usually don't get those until you've had an older forest where the trees have been allowed to grow old enough and long enough where they actually have natural, are dying naturally and then falling over. And then, um, you know, paying special attention to streams and other water bodies and how to protect the forest alongside those water bodies is really important as well. And in some cases, we, we don't have a lot of really mature forest or late successional stands in Maine, but where you do have them, it's really important to save these, what we're calling legacy trees. In addition to the wildlife habitat value, they also are excellent at storing carbon. And also when you have a more mature, diverse forest, with different species, different ages, different types, then it is more likely to be resilient in the face of a changing climate. So from a landscape perspective, you know, different, different um, landowners have more or less ability to really manage and, and create the kind of habitat we might like for our birds, depending on the size of their property and the what's happening around them. But on a larger scale, landscape scale goal, what we're really trying to encourage is more of this mature, older and mature forest on the landscape. Historically, that is pre-settlement, Maine's landscape was somewhere around 80 to 85 percent in mature forest stand, these are stands that would be over, really over 150 years old. Today, our older and mature forest stands together take up somewhere between two to 4% of the landscape of Maine. So we have very few, we have lots, uh, we, we have a lot of this intermediate age, particularly in the southern half of the state, and then in the far northern part of the state where there's been um, pretty extensive harvest activity on commercial lands, there's a lot of young forest. And so we'd like to see a better balance between these different age forests and we'd like to see more older and mature forests because that's where the, you're gonna find more birds. And the other thing we're encouraging is uh, to protect and connect diverse landscapes. So we know that the more biogeographically diverse the landscape is, the more likely we are to see that persist over time, even as the climate is changing. So where we have mountains and valleys and lakes, rivers, wetlands, and all of those are connected using what we're calling stream smart connections that are large enough so that the stream can really behave the way it wants to at different water levels. And both aquatic fish and other animals can move up and down the stream and uh, some of our semi-terrestrial and terrestrial animals can also move uh, along the side. We know that's really, really important for the long-term sustainability of our forests and our forest wildlife, birds and other species as well. So that's a quick introduction to our Forestry for Maine Birds program and our forest birds that we're keen into. Uh, I, for more information, I would encourage you to go to our website. If you're interested, we have tons of information. We have the three different guidebooks I mentioned, we have more graphic illustrations that are on the website. We have a virtual folder with a lot more information in it. This is emblematic of the folders we give people during workshops out in the field. We have additional resources for both landowners and foresters. We have the, the habitat assessment forms you can use if you wanna go out and do your handy assessment. 
We have um, trading cards that you can print out and cut up and take out with you in the field. And we have a whole suite of videos that we've just created this past spring and fall. Um, since we couldn't do live workshops, we wanted to try to recreate that through a series of videos. And, I, and we have some webinars that are recorded there too. But um, So I think that's it. And I would be very happy to answer any questions at this time. So let me stop sharing my screen. Awesome, Sally, that was great. Tons of good info. Um, I have a quick question. Have you been, um, I know you, you've given this talk and kind of gotten smaller landowners and smaller, smaller um, forestry um, concerns going with this. Have you been, have you reached out to or have you connected with any of the larger forestry, some of the industrial, you know, um, paper companies and stuff? About. We have. We, we've, we've actually, when we first started doing workshops for this program, we targeted for professional foresters, both consulting foresters and foresters that were working for the larger landowners. And um, a lot of those folks came and they were really interested in the program. But I'll tell you, a couple of them said right out front to me, well, yeah, this, this looks really great, but you know, that managing for mature forest characteristics, that should probably happen on public lands or other private conservation lands. That's, that's, that's not really our thing. So I think that, you know, that's a big challenge for us because obviously yeah. there's a lot of acreage, forest acreage that is tied up in those lands. However, there's, there's a lot that, I mean, a private, small private landowners own a lot of forest land in Maine as well. And we have gotten good response from a lot of, we've been working particularly with smaller landowners in Western Maine and then also in the Kennebec region. In fact, if any of you are woodland owners and you live in either of those areas, we, we have funding available to help you put together what we're, we're calling bird and wildlife friendly management plans and then get funding to actually implement strategies that can help create these structural features. We're, we're pushing for. Um, and the other great thing is that, the, I, I didn't mention this, but in our partnership with the, the Maine Forest Service, all of the district foresters, and I think there's about nine of them now, seven and nine of them, have been through our training. And when they go out and talk to wood, woodland owners, they will bring this information with them, they will provide it to landowners, they will say, hey, you know, if you're interested in birds or if you're interested in wildlife, here's this program that we'd like, like you to know about. And they have told us that because of this program, Forestry for Maine Birds, they're starting to see landowners reach out to them that never ever would have reached out to them before cool. because of the birds, because they see the connection. Awesome. Got a question coming in. Um, how many acres and um, how many acres comprise of in private? Uh, uh, sorry, how many acres comprise of private woodland? Yeah, so we we work with people who have at least ten acres, yeah. and you know the more the better. One of the things I didn't mention is that some of our bird species that we're targeting are what are called interior forest nesting birds. So they like a forest that's at least 250 acres. And wood thrush, for example, you, you find more individuals per acre and you find more uh, success when they are not only have that 250 acres of forest, but when that forest is in another block of forest land that's around 2,500 acres. So one of the things that I, that we like to encourage people to think about is what does your woodland look like and what are the surrounding neighbors lands look like as well. So for example, if you uh, are the only one with young forest around, then maybe you want to keep it in young forest so you provide some different habitat. 
in the area, but more often than not, you know, it's the older forest is what's missing. And so can you work together with your neighbors? We have, we have in several situations, we have neighbors that know each other that have come together and said, hey, we'd like to put together a management plan for these areas together. And sometimes that can be, you know, 500 acres between two people. And we, you know, I'm not the forester, I'm the wildlife biologist, so I, I depend on our forestry partners to help figure out, well, if there's not very much mid-story, what do we do to get that? And based on what your forest looks like now, and we want to create more mid-story, what is it that we would have to do to get that 10, 20, 30 years from now? And um, <laughs> it's been fun. With some of the foresters, when I after we've done work, typically we'll do a, a workshop that is combines a presentation like this followed by two to three four hours out in the field, and we'll go to different stands. We'll do the habitat assessments. We'll take a look at what's here now, what would we like to see, what's missing, what would we like to see, how do we get there? And I so many times I've had foresters say things like, you know. I will never look at the forest the same way because they're typically they're trained to think about the timber values yeah. or the pulp values. They're not trained to see the whole forest. They're not, they, they have no idea. I've had people say to me, geez, I, I, I had no idea. I just thought there were a bunch of warblers out here. I, know, I had no idea there were all these other types of birds out here or geez, I had no idea they use different parts of the forest. So it's really eye-opening for people. Birds are great for that eye-opening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on? In the it world. gets them to think about and look at different parts of the forest. Yep. All right, another question. Uh, Mary Grace asks, is it valuable having foresters visit property that is 15 acres and is not intimately connected to another stand? Sure, because there's still things you can probably do with that 15 acre parcel. And the district foresters, uh, it, I encourage anybody who's interested to call up your district forester. You can find their names right on the Maine Forest Service website and uh, ask them to come out and visit. That's what, they, that's what their job is, to go out and visit with people and do a walk and talk. And they can help you identify what your goals for the property might be and then how to accomplish those goals. It's, it's all about... What do you want to do with your land and how can I help you get there? If you decide you want to do any kind of harvesting, then they would steer you towards working with a consulting forester because they don't actually do that. They're not the ones that put together the forest management plan or that oversee a harvest, working with a logger and that sort of thing. But they, they're a great first contact person and then can steer you to the next step, whatever that might be. Got a request to repeat the areas you mentioned where funding is available. Western Maine, stretching from about um, the, the New Hampshire border, Lakes Country, just close to Bridgeton, up towards Moosehead Lake, and then also the Lower Kennebec watershed. So most of that the Kennebec watershed. And the, there's more information on our website. You can go there. There's actually maps there that will show which towns are within each of those two areas where we have funding available. All right, Lynn asks, do you recommend planting specific species in specific locations as part of your plans and in, and in specific numbers of trees? Um, Maine is a little bit unusual in that there's not very much tree planting that happens in our forest management profession. It's, it's more like, okay, I got a bunch of, I got a bunch of spindly trees here and then I have another really nice looking oak here. Maybe I will cut a few of these spindly trees and leave the good oak so it can grow bigger and, and have a, larger crown in it so that the scarlet tanagers will come. And then it'll also open up some more sunlight to get on the forest floor. And that means that 
natural, naturally seedlings will start growing. So there may be more oak trees there, there may be some um, white pine that gets started. And so it's, it's what we call, what the foresters call natural regeneration. Mm -hmm. there's, there's not so much planting. And Maine is, it's not like in the Southeast where there almost everything down there is planted. Here, foresters depend more on natural regeneration. You could still plant, you know, there are, there are, there are places where that is, is an option, um, but it's not the typical approach. Let's see, I think questions are over. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Oh yeah, yeah. Kevin does. Um, so the, the percentage of population decline in the western forests and the boreal forest are, are a lot larger than the percentage decline in the eastern forest. Are there specific practices or um, are differences between those regions that are leading to that difference? I don't really know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what the percentage for, for the western forests? Uh, it was something, I think the eastern was a 17% decline, yeah. whereas the western was 33 and boreal was maybe even a little more than that. I mean, I'm, I'm going to take a guess here, but I'm, first of all, they're, they don't have nearly as many different species out there as what we have here. But also, you know, a lot of those western uh, forests particularly more recently, have been hit hard by things like the bark beetle and, and just habitat alteration because there's so, so much development out there and fewer larger tracts of forest. So that's, that's a guess on my part, but I don't really know. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask a question as well. Sally, we yep. seem to have the eruption of the pine siskins and the evening grosbeaks and red poles already. Is there any reason for that that you would tell us about? Um, Michael, do you want to take a stab at that? <laughs> you, were just, you were just talking about grosbeaks. Um, let's see. I think I, I didn't do the reading up on this, so I don't have an educated, an educated guess. <laughs> I'm guessing it's a food resource thing where there's more food south and they're sort of following the food and or there's been a bumper crop of uh, nestlings this year and they're all traveling down, but I don't really know. You're gonna help me out with that. Yeah, you know, with, with the Eastern grosbeaks, they are definitely one of those species that responds to big cone years. Like if there's a, if there's a year when there's been abundant cones and nuts associated with the cones, then they, they will, their population will expand and then they'll start move, moving around. They're very nomadic. So they will move different places to try to figure out where that newest crop is. Um, with pine siskins and red poles, it's probably more of a, maybe, maybe there was a big year, maybe it was a good year for them reproductive wise up north and now they're moving south with the weather and they're just, Looking for food. Awesome. Sally, can, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about, um, I was actually, uh, there was an offering from uh, someone in Kentucky uh, looking for white oak acorns this year. And I have white oaks and I have red oaks and I offered her my white oak acorns and I have not had a one. Can you talk about um, mast years and how that affects. You um, didn't have any white acorns? No. Wow. None. How are your red oak acorns doing? Oh, a gazillion. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the crazy thing about, yeah, mast is super mast like, ac we like acorns, like beech nuts are really important for a wide variety of wildlife species. We've had three big years of red oak acorns in a row, which is highly unusual. And because t they, but you know, you probably heard some of the information that's come out in the last few years about how trees talk to each other a lot more than we ever knew that they talk to each other. So 
they coordinate uh, all producing a, a big crop the same year. And with oaks, it's often of either a four to six, seven year cycle. And so it's on, we've had these unusual back-to-back -back years where they've been producing a lot. This year I heard, that it, or I read, that it was probably because of the drought. So the oaks are feeling very stressed. And so they're producing lots of acorns to, and dropping their leaves earlier because they um, want to get, a, they think trouble is coming. So they want to get their seeds out there while they can. But the reason that they coordinate and they all produce the acorns at the same time or the beech at the same time is so that there are so many out there, at least some of them have a good chance of reproducing instead of being eaten by chipmunks and squirrels and jays and whatever, and the deer and the turkeys, and everybody else who loves acorns. Does that get at your question? Yeah, I'm just so disappointed because I really wanted to help this person who's working. Yeah, I don't know them. why. I don't know why the Here. white oaks would be different. And and, I, uh, and another uh, on the same property, we have all these beech trees, none of which are very big. They're all horrible. They're all cankered. Um, yeah. But this year, for the first time in several years, they've ha there's been a great production of beech nuts. Uh huh. Again, uh, you know. Maybe it's related to the drought too. I don't know. Anyway. But the, the beach, the, yeah, the beach are so, um, so many of our beach are diseased. It's, it's lucky if they get big enough to produce a good crop. Right. Well, anyway. So, and, and I guess um, since no one else is raising their hand, I have, um, uh, this forest that we have um, is, is small, maybe 15 acres total. And, um, there are a lot of terrible beech and saplings. Um, the biggest trees are the hemlocks, really the biggest trees are the hemlocks and the oaks. Um, and you sort of addressed this earlier about thinning out the, the skinny little trees so yep. that, um, you know, that's a lot of skinny little trees. And uh, I guess we could go in there with a, a chainsaw and just drop them and, you know, get them yeah. out of do you think that's worth it? Um, I guess maybe the for having the forester come in would be a way to yes. assess that. Yeah, having the district forester come by would be great. Yeah. And yeah. the thing that um, the best thing, the best way to think about it is, which trees do you want to keep, as opposed to which trees do you want to get rid of? And the foresters are often thinking about what, which ones do I want to take. You know, which ones right now have the best economic value do I want to take out? And really long-term, you want to be thinking about which ones do I want to leave so they're going to grow better and be here for a longer period of time. So then you then that de will determine what you want to do with those saplings. And if you just left them and did nothing, eventually they would thin out. Some of them would thin out and die over time, but they can be, then your nice oaks and hemlocks may not get as big as they might otherwise. Right. If you give them a little more space and light and air. Yeah. Jan typed in one question I wanna bounce off you. Um, the area of Maine that you identified as important to bird populations is also the area that the NECEC transmission lines will be bisecting. What effect do you think this will have on bird populations? Well, most of the literature says that bird, most, most of our birds don't see something like a transmission line as a barrier for their movement, so they can move from one side to the other. But having, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, it will destroy habitat. Secondly, you have... Um, you have fragmented the habitat. So as I mentioned, some um, quite a few of our forest bird species are what we call forest interior birds. So they don't like those openings. They, and, and often those openings are where we see more predators that will access the forest. So you tend to get more, th more red squirrels, more blue jays, more of those predators that will come in and either eat the eggs and or the chicks out of the nest. So you sometimes see lower productivity, even if the birds are there and they're trying to nest, they may not be as successful.
Well, I think anybody else have any other questions? Well, one just came in on the chat. Michael? Yeah. This, this, this is a bird question. All right. All right. Let's have it. So yesterday morning, we heard squirrels. One shrieked. Shortly thereafter, there were three mature eagles flying through a very low understory in our adjacent woodland. Wow. Three mature eagles. And overhead, much higher up, there were two soaring. Are they? I didn't think they migrated much. And I, why are, uh, we see them all summer, different <coughs> ages. Yeah. And, but why three mature eagles flying through at the same time, obviously looking for something, and then another two sort of flying north up or soaring? I was, I've never seen five eagles. Um, so eagles, eagles do migrate. Sally's going to correct me. <laughs> if yes. I something they stupid. Do. Yeah. But they do. Um, they're they're local birds and they're migratory birds. And they're right now the um, adults and the young are kind of moving around looking okay. for food resources that maybe they weren't using during the summer before they all end up either at the dump or <laughs> somewhere else where there's a regular yeah where there's a regular uh, ice fishing spot or or something. Um, seeing eagles fly through the canopy, I have never seen that before. Yeah, it was it was strange. Like three where they're like down low. That's pretty crazy. There must have been there must have been either hunting squirrels or there was something in there they were interested in. Yeah, well, they've been hanging. They hang around all summer. They've taken loon chicks and done yeah. terrible things, in my estimation. But um, we've seen a lot. And this, but this is the first time I've seen them fly that low in through the forest, actually, <laughs> or through the woods. It's not a forest so much. Yeah, that is definitely not typical. Yeah. Um, Chuck Didsmore just has a, has a comment that I'll read. Another overarching issue, the climate crisis needs consideration. Closed canopy, mitigation, closed canopy mitigates forest floor warming. Thinning of the canopy may not be in the best interest of fighting, cl fighting climate warming. Recent study of multi-county research published in Science. Science, that's right. So this is a comment about climate change. And yes, so we know that older more structurally complex forests store more carbon long term and uh, are better for the soil. Soil also stores a lot of carbon. A lot of carbon is stored underground in addition to this, the carbon that's stored above ground. So I'm, I wasn't suggesting that you go in and cut all of these trees down, just, just, just trying to, cr to create a more structurally complex and diverse forest over time which may, because we're starting in many cases with forests that are not like that, sometimes you can help boost them along the trajectory towards an older forest faster by doing a little cutting than by just leaving them alone. So much of our forest in Maine is this intermediate age forest, yeah. which isn't really great for the birds and other wildlife that like young forest, and they're really not that great for forest most of our birds that have evolved in older, more structurally complex forests. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's what I was trying, trying to get at. And we've also heard recently that riparian areas, those areas, there's been research recently about those areas along waterways that are also great for carbon storage. And those are places where keeping the shade over the stream is really important to protect the water temperature for our native brook trout and where the trees can fall into the stream to create different pools and riffles where the trout find their food and resting places. And so, yes, old forests, they're great. <laughs> Keep them going. <laughs> awesome. Um, everybody, thank you so much for coming. It was great. Thank you, Sally. You were um, awesome as usual. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Great information, and it's great to know all the things Maine Audubon is doing to keep the bird populations going in our state. So we're really happy about that. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Next um, second Monday of December, which I think is the 14th, we'll have Karen Bruder talking about tagging and tracking monarch butterflies and raising them from caterpillars. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, Hi, Karen. <laughs> and <laughs> she's here somewhere. I don't see her, but um, yeah. And and everybody have a great night. Thank you so much. 
And Thanks thank so you much. all for being interested and for your volunteer work. Yep, maybe you've already done or yet to come through the Maine Master National Program. I'm a huge fan of this program. So I appreciate you being able to be a part of it, just a little part of it. <laughs> Great. Thanks. All right, good night. Thank you, good night.